Hello my precious cinnamon rolls, my name is Fofo and I'm here back again playing Loren the Amazon Princess. Um, we're here in this rather unbalanced fight with three rogues and some goblins and I'm going to try not to die. First thing I'm going to do is put a shield spell on her. That only increases um, elemental resistance though so it might not be terribly useful. Ouchies. Let's see if we can... No, did I... Hmm. Use negative conditions. I don't think I really need to heal. I should probably heal myself. Breeze, I can do that as well. Oh, now we need to heal her. Just keep kicking him. <laughs> oh, I should have marked him as well. Uh, and Eleanor, they're gonna heal you. And now Karen's gonna hit the target. Oh dear. Oh, this is not good. Uh. Oh crap 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 crap. Thank you. Ah <laughs> try again. Oh dear. Um okay. There's no point using the shield spell because it only reduces elemental resistances. To, uh. Instead I'm gonna shoot the wizard. I think I was gonna shoot the wizard. Okay. Oh, Brazer is gonna mark that enemy and then do a whirlwind attack and again and Elidor's gonna heal her and up uh Karen's gonna mark she gonna mark mark as well No, uh, Braze is gonna mark that one. Um, I don't need to heal up because Eleanor's turn is next, so that's okay. There, heal her that. And Karen shoots with her bow. And Eleanor heals Brazer again. Braze is a lot tougher when we're actually fighting her than when we're using her. There we go. I better just save my game in a different slot. Uh, the main square has been eradicated of goblins and blood drips from the end of Karen's spear. The final rise was something. Oh, we've done this already. All right. <coughs> It was the second boss fight. I didn't save, this is why I had to do this again, so I've got the second boss fight. This is the one that I died died against uh, at the end of the episode, so I'll just skip forward. Um so we've got we've got Rob, a spearman, a wolf rider, and a wizard and a scout. Oh Karen's gonna mark. And Breeze is gonna mark that one. Ouchies. Karen's going to use her boat. Gonna defend because she's helpless at the moment. Gonna defend again. Eleanor's gonna heal Karen. Oh dear! Oh dear! That was not good. Oh dear! <laughs> oh crap! I just wasted that. Stop freaking dying! <sighs> Try that again. I might have to go back and uh, not and pick the other path and not go to the citadel because the three rogues is really difficult. 
Two marks. Okay, hmm. Braza, you hit him. And again. And again. Oh my god, stop dying. Thank you. Fuck's sake! <laughs> Stay alive! <Thank> you. <laughs> okay. Braza gets to go twice, so I'll mark him and then hit him. And again. And again. Oh, Grub is resurrecting people. That's not fair. <laughs> oh no, the wizard. Somebody's resurrecting something. Anyway. Mark. Give her a big potion. And hit her again. Power attack. And hit him again. Okay, so. Right, we managed that much. How have we got a... I heal spells only target one person at once. Okay, uh, better heal Karen. Karen's gonna mark him. Razor's gonna mark him as well. And then they're both gonna use it. Okay. Brazer's gonna mark Gob, Grub, whatever his name is. And then she's gonna use a potion on herself because she's helpless. Oh, I wasted a, um, a whirlwind attack there. Right? Karen's gonna mark him and attack him with a bow, and he's down. Oh, I didn't even realise Eleanor was dead. I wondered why she wasn't getting a turn. Oh. <laughs> that could have gotten nasty. Okay, so mark him again. Oh, and uh, Karen will have give herself a minor potion because she's uh, paralysed. Oh. Nah. How to do it? Yes! <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. The goblins were slain, but Grob still stood, refusing to die. Even if I die, this world is already lost. Force is too strong, even for your precious princess. He spoke through blood, but he glared defiantly, preparing to battle Karen, Eleanor, and Razor once more. Razor says, Surrender, you piece of filth! Rob says, Never. Rob raises his staff to cast a spell, but Eleanor recognizes his magic. It was a spell teleportation spell! Eleanor sprang at the head golem just as he started to fade from existence. Eleanor sliced through him with her sword, and he cried out for a brief moment. Half of the goblin body disappeared but his teleportation failed for the other half. The gruesome sights triggered everyone to look away, but there was no mistaking that Grob was no longer alive. With Grob defeated, his illusions crumbled, and the huge goblin army march, marching through the citadel evaporated, leaving only through a few real goblins completely alone and suddenly outnumbered. As the Amazons found these struggling creatures... The Amazons found these struggling creatures, despite them easily. I can't read today. The clean-up of the palace and the sea streets began. All of the goblins were toffed, tossed into a mass grave, but the dead Amazons were given proper pyres and burnt. Karen was exhausted from the battles, but she did her duty as the queen to restore the city to its original state. Raising the rest of the Amazons lined up to Franca for her support. Yay! Now we get to level up. Put that all in skill. Put that all in strength. No skill points. The time came to fly back to the Hammerlands, to continue the march never Neverborn. They each settled up a griffin and flew the vast stretches of land to the faraway dwarven city. Hammerlands were smoking when they arrived, but Lauren's forces were in control. It looked as if a, a very mighty battle had been fought there. As soon as the griffins landed, Lauren ran up to greet her mother. Lauren says, you're safe. Karen says, of course I am. Lauren says, and the citadel? Frieza says, free from a scourge of goblins, such her majesty. Karen says, how did things fall here? Lauren says, there was quite the drake. They turned to see Apollo Mensho approaching. It was an ordeal, but it was Delphid. Alan says, a drake? But they are so small. Lauren says, not this one. Alan says, where is Aaron Kiki? And Monsha says, hmm, he's with these soldiers. Alan nodded to herself, suddenly too aware how obvious the question might be at a time like this. Oddly, she didn't care much what anyone thought of her anymore. Alan was too relieved to know that the gladiator was safe, even though she would never have thought she would care for such a man. After a pause, Alan Monsha cleared throat. If you don't mind, I would like a word with all of you, in private. 
They looked at each other, wondering what sort of conver conversation the parliamentary needed to have with them. They quickly followed him into the keep. Elna stood next to a line waiting for Parliamentary to speak, but the, uh, <coughs> excuse me. But the old wizard was quiet and reluctant to say what he called them to hear. Princess Lorraine, King Karen, Ellen Law. You know that I and others have already fought force in the past. I should show you all now all that I have learned for that time. Karen says, you haven't told us everything yet? The old person says, no, no, some of it was too painful to remember. But now is the time to know, because we are so near. Laura says, tell us whether we are listening. Laura says, as you know, force is the spirit of a long dead warrior inhabiting his old suit of armour. However, he's not a typical demon, nor simply undead or even a whisper of a ghost. Elnor says, then what is he? He is a true death knight. He has been reborn and corrupted by dark magic in its robber's form in, in Inferno. Our world was one to ravage by his kind. Karen says, we're all capable of believing that, knowing the damage he has caused. Elnor says, what does this mean? How do we kill him? Elnor says, you cannot kill the embodiment of evil like any common beast. It's more complicated than that. Everyone's throats went right here in the dreading Polymatch's voice. He says, I did not know this during the old war. None of us were aware of the depth of evil we were fighting. But I have spent every year of my life since Force's arrival, uh, since the day Force Armour fell apart in researching his nature. Everything I've learned has led me to believe that when anything dies, a rift to the Underrealm is opened, and that is where our souls go. Eleanor says, The story about life after death, are they true? And she says, I do not believe what lies in the Underrealm to become called life. It is the realm of non existence, and we need Force to reside there permanently. Oh, it says, Underrealm? No, there is Inferno and there is Elysium. Those are the only two places one can go upon death. Ormish says, Nothing in my research can account for my existence. It may, in fact, be a frame of mind that you can achieve. I am not sure. And Lawrence says, Hold on, you're saying that Force didn't truly die when you killed him back in the Old War? Ormish says, No, rejoining the piece of armour would reanimate him, so his spirit was still very much alive, willing to wait however long it took until the pieces met again. It's true he was removed from our realm, but his soul was still unbound from death. We must find where his true spirit is hiding and eject him to the Underrealm where he belongs. Laura says, I will do whatever it takes. He cannot terrorise the world ever again. Mirth will find his location with a divination, and we will crush him. Apollomantra says, it is not so simple. Mirth's divination can only research this realm, and it is likely that Force is hiding away from away from our realm. Laura says, all this talk of realms. Apollomantra says, I have studied the theory of realms for many years, but they are only still only theories. True, I chose to believe them because they are the only explanation for Force remaining alive after all this time. The most important discovery of the theory of realms has already been proven in the last war. My daughter discovered it fighting a companion death knight to Forced. Alma asks, what discovery was it? Death itself is the gateway to the Underwhelm. Forced has escaped death, so he's incapable of dying. The door to his death has been permanently closed. To send him to the Underwhelm, we would first need a gateway. The group was quiet when they finished speaking. The silence allowed them to make the unfortunate connection. You, you were saying, Polymenter says someone must die. Eleanor went rigid, everyone did. Or says a sacrifice? No, she says yes. Or says who? It cannot be merely anyone. I wish it were that easy, but the task required of the martyr is too great. It requires someone with great skill and timing and someone who possesses enough greatness to create the rift in their death large enough for a death knight and, of course, for themselves. They could each hear the army celebrating the city through the windows, but the sound was in, made was in that room. Eleanor looked to the Ren and her queen. Both of their expressions were as grave as the news they had just heard. These were the two greatest people she knew. One of them was going to die, and willingly, Eleanor's heart wretched. Eleanor says, I will do it. They ripped around to face her. Eleanor says, Eleanor? Eleanor says, I know I'm not as great as you are, your queen, but it's because you are great that you must live. Eleanor continues, Aravon needs great rulers, but it doesn't need me anymore. I want to make this my duty. Eleanor says, absolutely not. Eleanor says, I will not let you do it instead. Lauren looked hor horrified. Polymancia says, you do not need to decide now. All of you need to be prepared, just in case. Oh, she says, we cannot rest all our hopes on just one person, so all three of you should prepare yourselves. They gave up arguing who would sacrifice themselves, and they all agreed to be nominated together. Which one of them would who would pay the highest, highest price was yet to be determined. Oh, she says, it may be, for the best, may be best for all of us if this is kept private. It caused chaos amongst their comrades if they knew what had to be done. Loren knew that everyone would attempt to sacrifice themselves, just as Eleanor had done. She had already made up her mind to become a martyr, but unfortunately so had Eleanor and her mother. The door opened and Mirth entered the room. She immediately picked up the attention and looked from where really. I'm sorry, but I think it's time to start our divina divination, Archwizard. Polymentia says, yes, I will accompany you. Mirth and Polymentia left the room quietly. The three of them stood in silence with each other for a moment longer. Lauren broke away first, briskly leaving. Car Karen gave Eleanor a compassionate yet pleading look and followed suit. Eleanor looked through the windows to the volcano just outside the city. In those mountains lay her fate. As a slave, she'd never thought she could give the world anything, and she never once desired to. 
But now there was only one thing she was sure of. Eleanor was going to lay her life down for our revolt. Merthyr was required to be isolated while she performed divination to secure forceful whereabouts. Polymontor used his powers to strengthen hers, giving her all that she needed. The process was expected to take days, and the army needed that time to recu recuperate, and for Lorraine, Karen, and Eleanor to mentally prepare themselves for what might, might await them in Everburn. After much soul searching, the entire party was prepared to face the trials ahead of them. Merthyr returned from the divination with Polymontor. She revealed the force of the secret lair underneath his castle, which was crucial information. Lorraine arranged for the army to mobilise in the morning. They had but one more day to train and one more night to rest, and it would be all over. God said, Make way for the caravan! A long string of wagons rolled into the hamlets, laden with crates, barrels, and heavily armoured men. It says, What are these wagons doing here? The city has been evacuated. It says, We know that! We know all about the war going on, too. We're not stupid. If we wanted to help out, the other merchants I got together are best supplies, we want to offer them to you. I says, That's great, thank you. I remember she says, For a price, of course. I said, of course. Okay, I'm just going to check in my inventory. So we picked up, we got some new items um, from fighting uh, Grob. So, yeah, that's a better staff for Draco. There's Merth. There's Merth. Let's see if that's an improvement. It's not an improvement. A minor frost sword. Uh, let's see, where is Eleanor? No, I'll keep it with the dagger because it's faster. And we've got a chainmail shirt and a vest of the oracle. Well, it's meant for a mage, so... Yeah, you get that. Because you only had a plain one. And that's everything. Shop. Sell that. Sell that. Sell that. Sell that. Sell the quartz. Sell the ruby. Right, uh, Eleanor, let's see what you. Anything in better? Not really. I don't want anything that drives her speed down, so no. Um, Loren, where are you? There you are, right. Two handed sword, no. One handed. She's already got better. Oh, that armor. That armor would be good. She's only wearing default stuff, though. He's wearing it because of the orcs. We'll sell those. I think we're done. This is have your men come to fight. Master Zeri says, We might have. Might. We're not going to risk our lives for nothing, you know. They grin, showing they were true blades for hire. Eh. I will pay you your dirty favour only because the kind will be useless for failure sex battle. I says, take it with my resentment. Gold is gold, lady, and now under your command will try to behave. Lauren ignored their seediness, knowing that the war on Everburn was worth any cost and needed the help of any hand, even those of bandits. Proceed. No amount of training or sparring would prepare Eleanor what was about to happen. All the reservations about the future suddenly seemed so pointless. She walked silently through the cold halls of the Dwarven Keep, Dwarven Keep listening to the battle preparations around her. Even that was numb to her. She opened the door to the room and stared at the last bed she was sleeping before the march and Everburn. And Kiki says, wait! On the jumped and she saw Am and Kiki bound towards her with a scowl. She racked her mind for a reason why he would be angry with her. Am and Kiki stood in front of her. His anger more like pain now. He growled disjointed words for his teeth. Anna says, calm down, what's wrong? Am and Kiki says, you had a private council with Loren and Karen. Was I, why was I not sent for? His words echoed down the hallway, causing Eleanor to flinch. She whispered to compensate. Polymentia didn't ask for you, I'm sorry. You must not have thought it concerned you so. Well, Kiki says, I know what was said. I know what role was to be mine if I was the sword bow. I know what he asked one of you to do. I know you would act as martyr. Eleanor swallowed, not wanting to discuss this so openly. Not with him, not yet. She dipped into her room, pulling Arm and Kiki inside with, her, inside with her, sealing the room shut. As soon as they were in private, she flashed her eyes upwards, and Arm and Kiki returned her glare. You're upset because you wanted to sacrifice yourself instead, is that it? Okiki says, I am angry. I know only this much, but I know that I'm angry. Eleanor says at me. Okiki says, yes. I can't believe it. You've been completely rational. You're right. I'm out of lime. I'm being miserable. I didn't think before I came here, and I'm enjoying it. Eleanor says, you what? Okiki tightly closed his eyes and bowed his head near her. His breath caught in her throat. Her breath caught in her throat, even. 
Nomads do not he need homes, but I'm no longer nomad. I want a home, I want to feel more than just need. I want more than rules or obligations. This this anger, it is one time wanting. And his eyes immediately locked them with Eleanor's. He moved closer to her, but she had no room to retreat, pressing up against the door, surrendering to his prying eyes. I want. As Eleanor says, what is it? Her words escaping now, he brushes his shadow fell over. Like you want. Oh, smoochies! Yeah, I think I might have broken the uh, Mesfit romance by going to the Citadel. So we got I'm and Kiki. I don't know, I'm not, I'm not complaining. I'm Kiki dove in quickly, slamming his mouth onto hers. His rough hands found her back, though she was already pressing against his hard chest as much as she could. He unhinged a deep desire in her, one that she had tried to bury every time she fought saw him fight. When he looked at her across the camp, when they had traded heated words, the jaws began to move deep in the kiss. Their breathing increased to a, uh, increased to a rate they had each. Ah, uh, I didn't ma mangled that. Their breathing increased to a rate they had each had only experienced in battle. It's hard to say. The gladiator to hungry could kiss her again and again, and then the side of her mouth, and then her chin. And he moved a little to her neck, uh, sucking at the sensitive skin there. Eleanor could not help but gasp and delve her fingers into his hair. Eleanor um, says, "But," and Kiki pulled at the fastenings of her lever, kissing her collarbone. Now, I am an elf. Whoa! I might. Uh, do I need to censor that? I am not sure. He returned his mouth to hers, letting his hand explore her revealed skin, turning her gasp into panting. Um, Kiki had no issue with her being an elf. He had stopped caring about that a long while ago. He tried to show her rather than ruin the moment with indelicate words. So they spoke with their bodies, their entwined arms and legs were spending resting as they turned around the bed for a fight for dominance of feeling the intensity of their actions to take it back. Each gone from slaves to free people in that one night, Eleanor learned what she wanted, not needed. She wished herself life, love and home too. In that greatest moment of passion, she knew that she wanted it all to be with him. When her sight began to dry her, his eyes felt like dreams, but only dreams. They were beautiful thoughts, but she couldn't bring herself to believe that they could be real. These thoughts paled as she watched Amakiki sleeping in the bed next to her, and paled, paler still when she was stern, held him closer. Pressed perfectly against him, she fell into sleep that would have been torturous if she'd been alone. She was not sure what she was feeling was love or simply passion, but they seemed, they both wanted to care for each other in a stronger and raw way. This was the only way they could think to express it. It was enough for them at the time. It was enough to get them through the next battle, and that was no small amount. Oh, we got an achievement for Smoochies! <laughs> right, I'm going to end this episode here. That seems like a good point to do it. Hi, this is Fo. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please leave a like, comment, and if you really liked it, please subscribe.